Welcome to Inspiration and Adaptation. I'm Asia Freeman, Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Art Center, and I'm super happy to be joined by Amber Webb. She's artist in residence at Bunnell Street Art Center this month. She's a Yupik artist from Kuriang, Alaska. I'm actually at this very moment in Brooklyn, but I wanted to acknowledge that Bunnell Street Art Center stands on lands that have been stewarded since time immemorial by indigenous people. The Ninilchik Village tribe is currently the steward of the lands where we live. After graduating from UAA in 2013 with a BA in woven fibers and a minor in history, she worked industrial jobs while designing apparel featuring Yupik language and solidarity with language reclamation efforts. Her drawings, explorations of pictorial Yupik storytelling, communicate contemporary stories of resilience, humor, changing climate, motherhood, historic trauma, and resistance. Welcome, Amber. Thank you. We live. Amber, so excited to um, have you at Bunnell this month, but at this very moment, um, that's not where you are. Where are you? And tell us what you're doing in Anchorage. Um, I'm at the Alaska Airlines Center. I delayed my trip to Homer a few days because my daughter was competing in the stick pull for NYO for Native Youth Olympics. And she, uh, she took the um, Southwest Regional School District title, and then I just watched her take fourth um, out, of, out of the whole state. So that was a proud mom moment. Um, so I think she's in there getting her award right now, but um, I'm still a little bit hyper from the adrenaline of just watching how hard those girls worked. Um, there's I uh, there's just so much energy that goes into that. And I, it's like. NYO is such a special moment um, every year and so many kids work so hard and it's really cool to see like how much sportsmanship that builds and just like strength and resilience and all of that. So I'm really grateful that um, that you guys were so flexible and let me stay here for an extra two days and work from Anchorage. Well, we definitely live and understand that work-life balance of being a mother, an artist, and a, you know, a full-time worker. And so um, just tell us a little bit more. You've got two daughters, right? Yeah, I have a daughter who's just about to turn five and one that's 15. And um, I live in Aleknagik and I currently work as the health aide there. So um, I guess, I don't know, there's art and then there's healing work. And I think the two overlap quite a bit, so. Um, I'm, I just, I'm just sort of like navigating that, trying, trying to make time for the art and then also, um, you know, take care of my community at the same time, so. Yeah, and it, it seems to me that your community is on one hand right there and also it's very large. Over the scope of your, you know, career already as an artist, you've had a tremendous, and I say even international impact with the works that you have done leading advocacy through art for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, specifically the, the Memorial Cuspuk, 18 feet wide, 13 feet tall, over 200 faces of women who've gone missing or murdered since what, 1950 in Alaska? Yeah, I think at least, at least, um at least 400 have been tracked, I think close to 400, uh, as far as I know. Um, and I, you know, that's like an kind of an unquantifiable issue for, um, for our people. So many stories will never be told, you know, but I think it's really a cool thing to be a part of because there's so many other artists who are unified in, in advocating for our women. And I, it's, it's like, it's our time right now, you know, like we, we are standing on the shoulders of like these powerful female advocates like Tilly Black Bear and Deesa Jacobson and, you know, uh, Michelle Demert and uh, Tammy Truett Drew and, and um, like many, many other Native women who fought so hard so that we could get to where we are now. And I think um, like everything I do and everything I've done 
is I always try to keep that focus in my mind. Like it, it I, I, I have mixed feelings about um, taking credit because I feel like, like you can't have like any, you, you have to, you have to um, um, keep your focus on the issue at hand. Right. And I feel like that project was a vehicle for other people's stories. Um, and so um, it's, it's an odd thing to be known for that, you know, when, when really like the stories are the, the should be the focal point. Right. So I try to, I try to like be really careful about not centering myself in that conversation, even though I am a native woman, just because it's, it's like something we all carry together. I think that's a super important part of that work. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a tremendous privilege to, to help you hold that work up quite literally to stand in a room, you know, where the, where the giant cuspic was too big to hang on the wall. And, and we just held it up together. And I think about how your work is also social sculpture. It's engaging, it's big, and it does include so many people. Um, you said, you know, that, um, these women, they are all our relatives. You, you really um, lift up the bigger story um, of the healing work. And I'm in awe of how you do that. I should, I should mention, you know, I was actually going to mention that. Um, like when I brought the Gus book to Benel, and that was the first time that anybody suggested that we all hold it together. And that was your suggestion. And then um, after we did that, I almost never hang it anymore because it completely changed the project and it completely changed how I felt about it and how other people interacted with it. And, um, I, it, it seems a lot more appropriate. And so I, I should just take a minute to, you know, acknowledge your genius there because, um, when I take it to schools or I take it to, sometimes people will ask me to bring it to their office to show their coworkers. Um, I always have people hold it up now you know, and, and it's, you know, like, and if you're talking about it and it starts to get heavy, then it's like, it's like a way that people who are interacting with it can give something to it, you know, like give their energy and in, into holding it. And then I can say, remember what this feels like, because we carry this all the time and now you're carrying it with us. And now you are a part of this too, you know, like reminding people that we're all connected. I think that's really powerful. So thank you for that. Well, it, it's, but see, you've articulated the thing that carrying it together is, I mean, it, it was, it was a physical act, but then just that you can recognize, and we all have that opportunity with art, which is such a fascinating and constantly um, transformative thing, isn't it? You, um, you are doing some work in your residency. You've described your project as pictorial Yupik storytelling and I'm um, extremely excited about, I mean, just really moved by work that you have done. And um, I was thinking maybe we could share some images and um, you could tell us a little bit about these themes, which of course absolutely span um, the work we've been speaking of and reach farther through other, you know, um, types of images into many of those themes. So um, I am going to uh, bring up that, that presentation of yours and let's see, there we go. And so there we are, and I need to just get into, I'll get there. I'll get to presentation mode in a second. All right, but I probably need to go back to the beginning. Do, 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 do. Gonna, okay, are we at the beginning? I think so. Okay. So I started with, I started with this piece because um, this was kind of the beginning of a really um, huge shift in, the style of my work and just like really kind of taking ownership about what I wanted to talk about instead of like trying to do what I thought people wanted from me I started just you know telling my own story and so this piece is um this is my grandfather's story 
Um, he was born on a dog sled between Clark's Point and Queen Slough. Um, and his mother um, married a Norwegian man uh, at the age of 14 and had three kids probably before she was 20. Um, and my grandpa was her third baby. So she was, you know, still a teenager. Uh, it was Christmas Eve and she, they were, they had gone to celebrate with some people and then they were, um, she went into labor in the dog sled and they, she had him, you know, on the dog sled and he was like, maybe, I don't know how premature he was, but he was premature enough that they had to scrape his eyes um, so that he could see. Uh, and he still had like blank spots where he couldn't see because that procedure wasn't complete when he was young. And he, by the age of 14 himself, was running barges up and down um, the Nishigak River and the Wood River and um, all over the bay. And he learned to fly planes and do all kinds of things, even with um, some disabilities that remained from being born prematurely. And I just, I think that like starting with that piece, it was, there's so many layers to who we are, you know, and it, it was like a part of healing from um, kind of the traumatic circumstances around being uh a person of mixed descent, you know, in, in the state and like, just kind of acknowledging that. So. Yeah, you, you have, um, you know, many different themes that are apparent in this work. And one of the things that you've talked about is how young your grandmother was when he was born. She, you said she, she was uh, between 14 and 20 at some point he was, he was the third child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, was it was it common for women to get married that young? I think it was. Um, and I think that, you know, the circumstances of the time, it was, we had lost so many people to uh, illness. And then there had been already so much trauma in our region that um, it was kind of like, a matter of survival and um but to me like that's what i would call that now is trafficking you know that's what i would call that because of the circumstances and you know she ended up going missing and she was missing for you know maybe like 30 years maybe even longer than that and then we found her um my, my grandpa was able to put her to rest um later in life um because um, it turned out that she had died of tuberculosis in a um, sanitarium in Sitka and her remains had been interred in this bunker for 30 years. Nobody knew where she was or what happened to her. And she, um, she left, she basically drank and drank and then died of tuberculosis. And that's, you know, so obviously that situation wasn't a good situation for her, you know? Um, and I, I look at her pictures and I see like all of the hope in her face and her wedding picture. And I just think, you know, I'm sure she had no idea what was going to be required of her, you know, as it's, I, I think it's like kind of disentangling what that says a lot of people at home are really proud of you know who their families are and their heritage and stuff but um i feel like it's really important to acknowledge what it was that was actually happening you know and that that um that's in us you know because like i carry the resilience and like the strength that she had but i also carry the trauma too you know yeah and, like all of us do and that's I think it's really important to acknowledge both. Absolutely. So I put this piece next. This was actually um, kind of just thinking about um, intergenerational trauma and how um, like the things that are passed down from mother to daughter 
you know, go back at least three generations just biologically. And so when I, when I do these drawings, the, the like bird shapes, I always think of those like prayers, like, like, because birds take things up, right? And then the X's I always think of as like things that are traumatic. And um, a lot of a lot of the like women tend to carry trauma in their wombs, even even before they have children. And so sometimes labor can be really um, challenging for women that have had a lot of trauma because all of it comes out. And and if you like the act of healing is so powerful because when you heal, then that trauma that you carry doesn't go into your baby, right? It, if you can, if you can push through that and heal through that, then it, it, it leaves you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was trying to illustrate how, um, that process how, what healing can look like when there is trauma and then through the process of healing, how it changes, you know, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense, but that was kind of what I was trying to communicate. And then, so the people on the sides are like, um, you know, our ancestors, all of, all of our, like the energy of the people before us that are supporting us from the other side of the membrane. Right. Yeah. And when you think about healing, it, it seems like art's a really critical part of that for you and the storytelling. I think so. And I think the work is always kind of temporary in my mind. Like, um, like with Yupik storytelling, we have story knife and we have um, like graphic work that pe people would draw these stories on, you know, tools or on drums or just on hide or sometimes just on the ground with a story knife. And it was um the story that was important not the not the work itself so I sort of um I think about my work that way it's it's temporary it's the it's the story that it tells that matters right and and then you know we like women not only do we tell those stories but we're basically like portals you know like and then the Yupik belief system our you know we we come back like like our connections with our families are so powerful that we come back to each other over and over again that's like when we leave this world we're not thinking about us being gone we're thinking about like how we treat people and how we connect in terms of like cycles of life like like hundreds of year cycles right and um and so I think if you think of women that way, it changes how, how you treat women, right? Like just the magnitude of that. And, and like in Yupik culture, the drum is really sacred because the drum is a membrane, right? And, and uh, women are like that too. Yeah. Wow. This is an amazing piece. This was a really fast sketch. Um, it was a really like, I, I was thinking about this story. My husband told me about how his grandpa, if, if there were spooks or like negative things kind of seeming like they were bothering him, he would fart at them. So this, the arrows are like represent a fart. So when you pick that would be a luck so he would he would look at the bad things and make them go away because um so that's uh, you know i kind of i put and he had to have um his uh, leg chopped off at some point in his life because of um diabetes and so i this was like thinking about that story that my husband told and some of like the different pressures that are put on especially on native men and like the power of native men through humor to like push that stuff away and still be amazing. And this guy was like legendary. He was, he was legendary for being really strong and for also being uh, a really 
uh, generous and helpful person. And so I, this was just a quick sketch thinking about him and my husband and that, just that concept. Amazing. And so through this work, I'm, I'm kind of trying to develop almost a language like by using the same symbols, even if they're really like how to make a symbol of an object so simple that you can recognize it over and over again in a story. So you kind of, because there are things now that we don't have symbols for, like we have, we have story knife symbols for a canoe, but we don't have a story knife symbol for a skiff, right? So, I mean, it's still a boat, but how do I take those like design concepts and then use them to talk about things we see now? And so this, this piece was, I put this in here kind of early on because when I moved from Kasilov back to Aleknagik, I started having these um, visions sometimes, like only when I would be outside, only when I would be um, either doing subsistence or going out far away from people. Um, and I had this vision of this woman, it was like on the clay banks of the Wood River and it was like not a woman, but it looked like a woman. and she was kind of black and she like folded herself up out of the bank of the river and and it was when we were looking for seagull eggs and so and the way she moved her body and the lines on her body were like it was it was revolutionary for me because it was like understanding that um like our connection to the land isn't vague or like hypothetical it's like realizing that our art probably came from similar visions that people had out on the land. And I don't know what that was. I don't know where that came from, but it was not anything that had ever happened before. And then it started happening more often after that. Um, so, you know, realizing that even though I've lost a lot of uh, cultural knowledge in my family, you know, through the last few generations, I know that that's still in the land. And if I go outside and I do subsistence and I do the things that my ancestors did then some of that knowledge comes back to me and and I should also say that this creature the way it moved it it reminded me of a Yupik dancer that I know so um the way she moves so it was pretty cool to kind of connect that with our our traditional dance as well yeah some of the the language marks like the visual iconography that you're developing I recognize the birds and the feathers um tell me about the movement of like black and white through the figure you, know, you make interesting decisions about dark figures and light figures dark areas and light areas that are really fascinating and beautiful so I think sometimes I do dark figures to represent things in like this world and light to represent things like in the other world or in another dimension, like, like recognizing that there's a barrier between our ancestors and us. And so it's like a lot of the time these, these female figures that I'm making are half in this world and half in another one. Somebody just passed me, my friend. <laughs> That's amazing. So this drawing was um, kind of continuing that process of um, dealing with um, trauma through art and, and like talking about it through art. I, I was thinking about, um, this is a very personal experience of uh, how substance abuse has impacted my family. And, um, you know, like, fishing is such a huge part of our culture but it's kind of a mixed bag because like just like we have this relationship with the seasons that's really um sacred then we have um the trauma and then there's the substance misuse and then there's this trauma cycle that follows that like often follows the fishing season in our communities and it's it's not who we are but it's part of what has come along with with commercial fishing in our communities and i think we we revere 
commercial fishing and that's like our lifeblood and that's what we all do but I want to talk about things other people don't want to talk about and I want to talk about that pattern and how you know the impact of all these other things have kind of created this um this cycle and also like kind of looking at um how um like how aces work and how traumatic experiences live inside of us and then you know create these circumstances so the lady has a hammer she's trying to break this bottle you know and trying to break this pattern and these kids are affected by this pattern of of trauma and then there's a cupcake and you know like some of the things that and money some of the things we didn't we didn't really have those things before but we have them now and um so I guess I was kind of trying to tell that story and I hope it's kind of I hope it's readable, you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's absolutely readable. And then there's this fascinating fact that you did it on cardboard and it's partially kind of like, um, you know, torn. And I was just wondering, is that, is it a ready material? Does it have another um, significance for you? It's really organic. It's like, it's a, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my career being very poor, so. Um, I've worked different jobs and art's always been my my career but there have been a lot of times where I really couldn't afford art supplies and so I started drawing on cardboard just to have something to draw on and then um, I if I have something that's pressing that's just really urgent that just has to come out of me I'll draw it on anything and that was the piece of cardboard I had and so I just tore it up and started drawing and it just was that's just how it happened you know and the the tears weren't really intentional, but once it was there, I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> I'll just, I, I think like, especially working with ink, ink is really not a forgiving material. And I like that because there's like an honesty to that where like, I'm not showing, I'm not showing perfect things, right? I'm showing the process of creating something and acknowledging that like, it just is going to look how it's going to look just like life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Completely. And you can't take it back once, you know, some things you can't take back. Yeah, yeah. So this one is a commentary kind of like processing. There's this belief that my, my, my Blackfoot friend shared with me about, you know, substances having spirits. And so you know, we've had our, our different struggles with um, meth and heroin and, and, and those are struggles across the country. But this, this man is, he's got Ayuk, he's got sacred, you know, um, Labrador and, and Jaisluk, and he's got fish inside of him and he's blowing at the meth, blowing it away. And so I was, and these girls are down below are twisted up on meth you know and I was trying to um create like a physical rep representation of resilience like this man is powerful enough to push that spirit away so it was kind of like a prayer like that 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 pushes through our communities yeah. and and that that's that that person is powerful enough to and then the, the big face in the background is what I think that if if meth were personified, that's what it would look like, right? Mm. Yeah. And where is this picture now? Um, this picture is on its way to Bunnell's. So this is part of the show. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> oh, and I should say the wood is... Um, the wood is, it comes from my husband's uncle's house. Uh, they were going to throw away some drawers that were from that house and they put them outside and I, the wood was still good, but they didn't want them anymore. And so I took, I took the wood from that house and made this and there's a couple other pieces like that. And then some of the upcoming pieces are on flooring from um, Cyrano's. When they changed their flooring, they gave me the, the flooring and I've been sending it down and using using it for for art so yeah it's really powerful on recycled wood I mean I love the presence of the grain 
and the way it you know refers to the land and it, it also refers to um you know extraction and the process of use and reuse and thinking um just thinking really um redemptively about using materials using stories and using trauma as, as I think those materials have stories already. And I notice the work is always better if it's on something recycled because I don't, I'm pretty organic in the way that I operate. And so if the work is like um, on something new, it doesn't always have the same feeling to it and it bothers me. So if I could get enough recycled material to keep working on wood like this, that would be ideal, right? <laughs> okay, that's so good to know, yeah. Yeah. So this is the same source, the same wood. Um, and this came from um, going out subsistence fishing and putting a net out to catch fish for my family with my husband. And I had another one of those visions, only this time it was this creature that came out of, it like popped its head out of the water like a fish and then like folded itself in half and became personified in my it was like, uh, I'd never seen anything like that. It was pretty far away, but I think it was um, the same area as that other vision. And I just was like, hmm, interesting, interesting vision. So I, I feel like if, if I'm having those, I should quickly draw them out so that I can remember them. Um, and I've tried to duplicate this piece a few times because everybody really likes it and I haven't been able to do it like it never came out the same way again when I didn't have that wood to work on, you know? So, um, and that wood's probably been in Electnagic since the sixties or seventies. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. So that's, that really is one of your materials is the presence of that recycled. Yeah. That recycled material. Tell me a little bit more about the image. So we have the figure coming out of the fish out of the water and then we have a boat and I I'm kind of trying to draw boats that way that's like a theme you'll see and then there's the cork line and the anchors and the buoy just like the setup for subsistence fishing and the water in the background um and that was an interesting trip because um like these really I, I think they must have been big fish. They could have been logs, but I think they were big fish. We'd see our net go crazy and then we'd pull it in and there would be this huge hole where something really big went through the net and, and we, we couldn't catch them. And they were just like tearing through our net and we were like, what the heck was that? You know, I don't know what we were almost catching, but it was, if it was just really big king salmon, cause I've seen really big king salmon, but um, so big that they just couldn't be caught. And then, and then I had this vision. So hmm. it was like, who, who knows, but it was kind of a, and then that same trip, we saw um, an interesting looking bear on the bank, like as we were fishing and uh, I don't know. So that's like kind of commemorates that whole trip for me, that this piece. And what about the, the uh, markings, the tattoo on her body? So I'm, I try to really pay attention to those visions and represent them the way that they looked to me. Um, I, I really think it's important not to confuse those tattoos with uh, the traditional tattoos that women get because I don't think it's quite the same thing. Um, I think like the way that tattoos are used to show who you are. Um, that you pick culture, you mean customary tattoos? Yeah, like the, the um, the chin tattoos and the different tattoos, they have meanings, right? And so I try to, if I'm gonna draw tattoos on my um, on my figures, I try to represent the um, non-human entities a little differently, just as I saw them, you know, in whatever vision I had. And I think that, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't want people to think that what I'm doing is, um, like trying to change the history of tattoos it's it's something different than that um but 
Yeah. They feel like looking at the, the imagery of the tattoo on her body. Um, do you have a sense of what it might mean? Um, well, when I, when I saw the image, she had like animal heads, like in certain spots. And so I put those in there and then, um, I don't know there's like kind of arrow shapes. And, um, I think that the one on her cheek, maybe like might represent kind of like a fish eye, like the eye of the fish as she's, um, morphing into like a humanistic, like kind of like taking on personhood, I guess. Um, and then the other lines in the black area are, I was thinking of them almost like the flesh of the fish, like a, a, fl a fish splitting in half and becoming a person, you'd see the inside of the fish, right? Like um, as, as this thing kind of folded itself out from the inside, um, because that's what, it, that's what it looked like, you know, when I, when I saw it. So, and this representation, you know, like the things I see in my head and the things that come out of my hand never look the same, but <laughs> that's, that's probably most, most artists. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you interested in that kind of the way that that happens? I mean, some, some of us welcome that and other times it's really a struggle, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it as a struggle. I think it's like, um, I feel like it, it, whatever comes out, comes out and that's okay. But I also, um, I think it's like, it's important to be like honest in art mm -hmm. and, and how are we honest? Like, what does that even mean? But to me, it means like, like not getting too in my head about it and just letting it come out how it's supposed to, because I think if I saw it, that's probably what I'm supposed to do is just let it come out of me. Right. Um, yeah. But I don't know. If, I don't know if that makes sense either. But that, absolutely. So this piece kind of has a funny story. Um, my daughter. There's there's this um, story that is told to children and adults, but a lot of the time it's told to children, um, kind of like admonishing them to stay out of the tall grass and it's this character called Stuchbuck and Stuch is like a fingernail right so Stuchbuck is this like creature that used to be a person that isn't a person anymore and she has the long nails so Stuchbuck is like long nails and she um her story she basically cannibalizes her family um and then starts you know she eats people and so that's why she's terrifying and I won't I won't tell the whole story but my daughter loves the story and I drew this piece for I was going to sell it at a booth at I think like a was it a just transition um craft fair several years ago and my daughter told everyone that came to the table that uh I told her I'd give it to her if nobody bought it <laughs> I was like you can't you need to stop telling people that and then a lady bought it for her a really nice lady was like, now you can't sell it because she kind of kept saying that to everyone. It was really funny. And so, but it was like this, you know, kind of like experimenting with symbolism and also like showing, like, I think it's, I think it goes against some of the traditions to show or talk about or represent scary things like that. But mm. I you know it just came to me and I had to do it so here it is and is, do you do you have hesitation about showing the story partly because of what you were saying that traditional value around not showing the scary yeah maybe that and also um I'm not the best storyteller so, <laughs> so I I'm better at like images so I you know and there's a lot of different versions of the story but um I wish my daughter was here because she tells it pretty well she really likes to tell that story, but um, you can find it on um, YouTube. There's versions of it. Um, what would it be called on YouTube? Uh, I think it would be called Stuchbuck, like C-E-T-U-P-A-Q or Long Nails. If you look up Yupik Storytelling, it might even show mm -hmm. up or Yupik Scary Stories, it might show up then too. And what are some of the other elements in the drawing? It looks like a 
we're looking at a cross section of a bone, like marrow, maybe, I don't know, on the upper right above okay. the fingernails. And because in the story, she in the story, she's she like, OK, I'll just tell it. So she's um, burns her finger and she starts sucking on her finger and she likes the way it tastes. So then she um, eats part of one of her hands and then she waits for her children to come home. And every time one of them comes home, she eats them. And then in the story, she has a pot and she puts their limbs in a pot and then she sucks the marrow out of their bones and like it's so scary and then you know it's like but I think that was a really important tool in getting children to respect danger and respect that you know we live in a place that's incredibly dangerous and you have to listen to what people tell you like don't go in the tall grass because something might eat you you know so it's like really basic but if you scare kids so much that they're like oh I'm not gonna go in that tall grass that's terrifying I don't want to fuck to get me <laughs> like then you know it's it's a lot more effective than like any other form of discipline I know um yeah I never the tall grass so I still don't actually <laughs> wow yeah and and it might be a bear but it could be something else exactly exactly wow So I, I put this piece in, this probably isn't the most um, like neat of my pieces of work, but I, I really wanted to show, especially after doing a lot of work on the Gus buff and, and talking about a lot of heavy things to just show um, like love and affection. And, and this is where, you know, I started getting into um, uh, trying to represent more diverse um, female bodies and and like really carve out some space for for that so I um and then you know in our stories like things don't always proportionally make sense like impossible things can always happen so I was thinking about like mm -hmm. how you know in the in the face of huge love like your your arms could become like impossibly long to embrace somebody that you miss who who maybe lives far away and mm -hmm. then I put some stitches in there uh, and a needle a threaded needle like um kind of representing how like so men protect women right and then women um have different things that they do like they mend clothes and they sewing is um such a huge part of um, traditional Yupik feminine identity. Um, so I kind of, I was just playing with some of those themes, but we hear so many bad things about, about our people and there's so many good things too, you know? And so if I'm saying this is not who we are, I should also be thinking about who are we and how am I going to represent that? Right. And so this is just kind of, a, and then like, I kind of wanted it to look like they were almost becoming a part of each other. Like those old, those old uh, married couples that have been together for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and they take care of each other and they just are almost like one unit. They like become almost one person in some ways um, because they know each other so well. And so I just, I was kind of thinking about all of that. And this is what came out of it. Yeah, it's strong. So this was an earlier, this was one of the first of these larger bodied women that I started making. Um, and I, I kind of just like, I, I was thinking what, how do I represent myself and like myself for myself? You know, I'm like not hiding anything. I'm not like posing in a seductive way. I'm just like, how am I when I'm relaxed, you know? And, and then I was thinking about traditional tattoos and like, I know that these aren't placed in the traditional spots. And I know that like anything, 
any tattoo work on your stomach is going to be incredibly, you know, painful. Uh, I re recognize that, like the impossibility of that. But um, I was thinking if you had tattoos that were made specifically to um, accentuate like round women's bodies, what would that look like? And so this is what I came up with, you know, like, like accentuating the way our skin moves and the way it looks and then like you know because it's you know that's that's a form of beauty that I think is sometimes underrepresented and she has a jar of ufuk in her hand so she's she's having a traditional snack so I called this you know midnight snack I think is what I called it and I was kind of playing on words like is she eating snacks or is she the snack? You know, like I don't, nobody's really sure because here she is. And um, so she's got a pilot bed cracker and an ulok and some muktuk and some um, ayuk tea and some dry fish. Like, you know, and somebody suggested it's like maybe after a mate, you're like after a steam bath, you're like having a snack because we do that, you know. Yeah, it, it's it's incredibly beautiful, this piece. I'm just blown away by it. The, yeah. the, use of, the use of black and white and the inventive mark making of her body it's it's just it is stunning I'm really trying to understand how how those the, our traditional designs were made and how like like at, m the goal is eventually someday to be in a place where I'm making designs in that mindset so I'm really I'm looking at that work from a long time ago and trying to understand it and trying to represent images in a similar way. Um, like where, and it seems like kind of the root of that style of work is um, it's forms. It's not color. It's like, how do you represent forms? And so I'm kind of playing with how to do that and like, and then like how that can create focal points and things like that. Um, and I really, I think, part of the joy of it for me is to make the parts of our bodies that maybe sometimes we hide make that the focal point like and and like a source of beauty because I think it is um and Absolutely. yeah and then we want like all of these girls growing up now to feel like you know beautiful and proud of themselves because they are beautiful you know yeah every bit of the fullness is the beauty here every bit of the you know the roundness and the fullness and the um from the hair you know and its wildness every part it's so beautiful so this was just kind of another in that series thinking about um and i wish i had this piece to bring to the show but it got ruined um during that the flooding at my office I had I had a flood happen and a lot of my work that I had made in this series got ruined but this one um like is about uh Malke and about like it getting clean but also it's it's a lot more spiritual than that you know and um it's not just washing it's like purifying your spirit too you know like mm -hmm. and purifying your pores and your whole being so I um and then just sort of continuing the the series of of round women and especially you know I know a lot of women that I've talked to over the years that um and and you see you see women you know doing different western things to feel beautiful in a western sense and then um I think what's beneath that is sometimes internalized oppression and I I, I want to like, just like loudly say that our beauty is just unquestionable. You know, like the beauty of, of native women is unquestionable and you don't have to, you don't have to, like we can just use our own beauty standards that we've always had. And so I guess I, I'm just trying to honor that, you know. 
Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you, um, you know, have documentation of this amazing work. Perhaps you can revisit it, you know, a different scale or different material. Um, it certainly speaks to how important it is to do works on paper or do works on cardboard or with whatever you have at hand. Because the point, the point of like lifting up more expansive ideas of beauty and the point of um, proposing, um, you know, ideas of mark making and body adornment that are also ones you've, you've conceived and you've visioned um, and allowing that to be simultaneous with traditional and historic rep forms of representation. That is all true. That's really powerful. It looks like wormwood above her shoulder, like a cleansing. Is that? Yeah, yeah. The um, that's the the medicine, right? Like that's you can drink it or you can put it in your mache water to clean yourself. It's like cleans you inside and out, right? It's like our sacred medicine, so. We always keep that in our, our mafe and use it when we steam. So it's it's interesting too because it's also um I've been to Korean baths where a wormwood tea is used to clean your body before um steaming, before you know, soaking. And I've um that's fascinating just in terms of latitude and proximity, you know, peoples and traditions resemble yeah. you know, resembling each other in, in multiple ways. That makes sense. I didn't know that, but that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm happy to know that. Fascinating. So this piece, I didn't really, this didn't really turn out the way that I wanted it to, but this was, um, I've learned a lot about the seven sisters from the Jilong area, and I'm a descendant of those sisters. And so this is like, the seven sisters and their mother. Um, and the story of Chilyung is the water churns. Chilyung is Dillingham area and the water churns. Um, then they say there's a monster with circular rows of teeth that spin that make the water churn. Um, and that's where that's where the Wood River and the Nishigak meet the bay. So that's where the fresh water meets the salt water. And it's a place of mixing, right? And it's become um, a place of mixing in so many ways, but you know, a significant amount of, of people in that community trace their ancestry back to these seven sisters. And so I, I wanted to like, kind of think about what that, I don't know what kind of monster it is, but I was, when, when I was thinking about that story, I was just seeing those women like in that monster, like the fortitude that they had to have to survive the things that they survived and and that that's why we're all still here you know uh, and like almost like they're crawling out of that monster right like that's what we're doing now and so I gave this to our tribal administrator because she's also a descendant of those sisters <laughs> it's just so powerful that you have a traditional story about the mixing of waters and then you know the conquest of Alaska and peoples and mixing, you know, of um, blood, you know, mixing of ancestry and that that churning, that that intertwining of stories, identities. It's such a powerful piece. Thank you. So, it, you know, a theme that's kind of come out of uh, these different visions that I've had being outside is like um, that. So we have these stories of, of the, you know, like a wolf tipping its head back and taking off its coat, taking off its fur, you know, and become becoming a person in different contexts in a lot of our stories. And I'm really interested in like, is there a way for me to capture that exact moment where the personhood emerges from the animal? Um, because if you're like, I've kind of been just trying to understand how 
that concept of personhood extends to everything. Um, I mean, because it extended to, to rock and to land and to water um, and, you know, plants and everything had like a personhood to it and still does. And so, and then the wolf, so this is supposed to be a, a wolf, um, but sometimes the wolves are ichjinhats, they're like the little people, and sometimes they're just wolves. So I guess this one might be some form of um, ichjinhats, like um, a creature, a spiritual creature that sometimes is a little person and sometimes it's an animal, right? It's a really powerful image. I keep thinking of transformation. Um, and which way is it going? You know, is the wolf, I mean, what do you think is? You think I think that, cool? I think that the wolf is becoming a person, but I also, I also think that, um, like, you know, we, we have to conform ourselves all the time to fit into these systems that were not made for us. They were not made for us. They weren't made for us to succeed. Quite the opposite fact. Um, and I'm like, you know, like we're allowed to keep some of our wildness. That's like that wildness. There's a sophistication to that, that it's not primitive. It never was primitive. And so like, if I'm thinking about taking that back and, and honoring that, then that's kind of where some of these transformation pieces are coming from. Like, like not only acknowledging a belief system that was intentionally like stolen from a lot of people, but also um, acknowledging that those kinds of belief systems are still in us. And so I put the the two rows of teeth I started putting, sometimes I'll put the two rows of teeth um, to represent the Chilung area. And then sometimes I put other things, but this one has those two rows of teeth because I um, I made it around the same time as I was making those uh, pieces with the, the monster. Wow. It'll be really exciting to transcribe your words and be able to put them near your pieces if you'd like. This piece I did actually, a, um, a, a relative asked me to make a piece for his friend's um, uh, retirement from work and the friend was from the Kuskokwim area. So I decided to try and draw uh, a representation of the old story of the boy that goes to live with the seals um, and the, the shaman, he, the, the mom goes to the shaman and, or the, the, um, the, um, word is escaping me the the mom goes and talks to the the medicine person and says um i want my son to be a good hunter and so he says the son the son has to go live with the seals under the ice for a year um and and learn from them so he can learn how to be a good person and a, um, a lot of lessons in that story come out like uh when you shovel snow from your walkway and from like elders walkways the snow lands on top of the seals house down below the ice and the seals look up and see your face and then when you're out hunting they'll recognize you and they'll give themselves to you because you're taking care of things um just like if you mistreat um an animal's remains then those animals might not want to give themselves to you again and that like that story kind of talks about that relationship um, as a relationship, you know, and so I, I did that drawing for him and, and this is just kind of, I guess, an interpretation of that story. Yeah. So this was one of the very first images of bigger women that I made it kind of, it was kind of the birth of that whole, um, concept and it's changed a little since I made this, but, um, this was like just kind of a revolutionary moment in my own um, experience as an artist, I think. Just, um, yeah. 
sort of a, a benchmark or watershed work. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. oh, I might have had that one in. Okay, there we go. So this one is like, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit, it's like, I was trying to be funny. So like, when we eat bones, we it's called bulking, you know, and you suck the marrow out of a out of a moose bone or a different animal bone, and that marrow is really rich and fatty, um, and it's like messy to eat those. And like we have jokes about not wasting food and you know cleaning the bones and stuff. And so she's got her napkin and her tea, right? <laughs> and then the and she's eating the bone, and I just like. I was just being funny, I guess, but like, I really like playing with like the richness of our cuisine combined with the richness of us. So. And the irony of that silly, tiny, ridiculous little napkin, you know, right. <laughs> like what's she going to do with that? Like, right. What, what's that good for? <laughs> right. Like it's funny. <laughs> yeah. But she has it there in case she needs it, you know? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this was, I just did this one the other day and it's also kind of just being funny. I was like, I imagine so that there's a lot of foxes on the road I live on and they always eat the spruce chickens and the ptarmigan. And so we're always like, man, those foxes always eat our birds because we want to eat those birds, right? So I was, and you know, it's another one of the, trying to capture the moment of shape shifting, but I imagined this fox at night, like, just in the dark of winter just ate a ptarmigan and there's its like footprints and its remains and then the maybe the fox then has the strength to take off its coat right and, and yeah so I, I put the I put like the little tufts of feathers and the feet like <laughs> yeah yeah love it and then this was kind of earlier on but it was just like another in the series of um, like impossibleness, like like exaggerated forms and and how beautiful that can be. Like somebody told me that the, you know, in, in Yupik, Amok means breasts and how they look almost like buoys. It's like yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting to think of the whole you know, the whole body as a landscape and, you know, all of the and different. Just, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. I... I'm just thinking like how, if, if you're thinking of the body that way, then like a, a large body is just like so luxurious as a landscape because there's so many different um, ways that it can look. And um, I, I'm really interested in, in, differently shaped bodies and, and trying to create images that honor like all women. So I don't want them always to look the same. I want them to look like, you know, all different kinds of people. Right. And so I, um, these are just like really joyful. They're just really fun for me. And they're like, after I do, you know, four portraits of women that have been murdered. I, I have to do something that makes me happy and that makes me feel like good about the world and mm -hmm. um, drawing, you know, fat women makes me so happy. <laughs> like it's so joyful to me, like just to, to cre create space and like, it's just really fun. So I hope that that's communicated through this work. Absolutely. I mean, I think too about like the body and especially the lover's body or the mother's body as a space of refuge, you know, and um, you create a lot of space in that generous image for, you know, yeah. experience. So this so is this our last slide, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I almost didn't share this one, but my husband really liked it, but it was, um, I was thinking about the Thunderbird. I've been thinking, so there's this bird that people sometimes see in the, in different parts of Alaska, that's impossibly large, like the size of a plane. It's like the size of a, like a small super cub or something. And you know, people don't see it that often, but I, I've heard stories of people seeing it. Um, 
and there's a lot of old stories of people seeing that bird and I don't know why I was thinking about it but it was on my mind for like a week and so I was like thinking about like when things are coming out of animal hood they they I, I always imagine that they have to like unfold themselves right and that their movements are kind of unnatural and the way their bodies move are kind of it's kind of like an unnatural thing so I so I I kind of wanted to play with what that might look like um and maybe someday I'll capture that exact moment perfectly like the movement of that moment but this was just sort of thinking about that, I guess. Yeah. I, again, I'm fascinated by how you use like the overlay of positive and negative space and shapes and lines, like the way the um, foot becomes like a bird claw and there's a, it resonates with the hand sweeping out to the sides, but it, it stands out in, in, a, in a powerful way as a positive shape against the dark. And what seems maybe like simple decisions are really very considered and very powerful. And that expresses movement. You know, it makes that, it makes that shape kind of like um, float up. You know, it has, it makes, it makes your eye <clears throat> move around and pick up other shapes like that. A lot of different ways to think about movement in terms of, you know, what's theoretically static and two-dimensional, but there's so much swirling movement too with the feathers moving around and that sense of air currents move through the hair and, and you know wings and feathers. Really feels like an animation of a vision of transformation. I'm, I think that this one maybe was like, it didn't come out the way that I wanted it to, but it's, uh you know, like process work is, is good too. Like how you, how you come to some of those more articulate designs kind of is by just making stuff and figuring out where things should go and things like that. Yeah. That process is really essential. And, and you said you weren't, you weren't sure about showing it, but I'm so glad you did. It's, it's really powerful. Will this also be in your exhibition? Yes, this will be there. Yeah. Fabulous. So Amber's in residence at Benel Street Art Center in Homer um, through May 6th when her exhibition opens, her exhibition for the month of May. Amber, thank you so much for meeting with me and for taking the time to share with all of us these incredible images of power and transformation of resilience and imagination. So excited to have you in residence at Benel Street Art Center with support from National Performance Network. Thanks, Asia. See you, see you soon. Okay. Take care.